and was excited to see that here we have somebody who's not just speaking, he's actually also practicing what um, he's talking about. Welcome, Prof. Prof, you're muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Ah, okay. Thank you so much. I was worried about uh, you know missing out on such a good thing. Thank you all very, very much. So what I'm going to talk about, I don't know if you receive the documents or get it uploaded, but uh, unfortunately I got a power outage problem here. So if you can just bear with me a little bit, please. Um, that is fine. Hello? What I would like, if the tech, that, yeah, we, we can hear you very clearly. And I'll ah, okay, very good. So okay. let's go about it. Yes. And should I continue in French or English? Um, you can use either because we have interpretation. So ah, very good. Donc, uh, in this case, uh, French. Continue. Hello? So I'm, I'm going to talk about the Kuruk and Fuga Charter and the endogenous governance in Mali. This teaching and this information is drawn from the system of our Malian ancestors. They implemented this system to, to create a society. And I received in legacy this system from my mother and father family. So this teaching system is called Dokaidia. It is uh, the, the mix of several systems coming from uh, sedentary, semi-nomad and nomad communities. And the purpose here is to create a nation family. It goes beyond linguistic differences, ethnic differences, cultural differences. And the purpose is to make sure that everyone gathers around an extended family. So there are alliances between communities and between families with one single idea. We are part of the same community. And the Kurgan Fuga Charter was the first document codified. And then it was uh, it was transmitted from generation to generation. And this is why now, even today, we base ourselves on this charter. For 10 years, there were horrendous civil wars, atrocities, violence took place in our country. And this took place from 1225 and 1240. So there were great disparities and at some point, one ethnic group dominated over the rest compared with another ethnic group. So this was in turn, but uh, there were wars during this period. In 1,235, violence reached such an extent that people realized that things needed to change. People needed to stop acting like animals. And we needed to become human beings. So we needed to stop acting like lions, like beasts, in order to increase our human dignity. And this is why the Kurukan Fuga Charter was created. So representatives, war chiefs, religious leaders, women leaders, seniors, business leaders of all ethnic groups, people from the savannah and from the forests, everyone gathered in order to, to determine on which basis we would build this nation. In total, there were three series 
of major decisions. First, there were the five values of citizenship. So beyond the ethnic identity, beyond our origin, we wanted to belong to one uh, common nation. And it was, uh, the symbol was uh, the hippopotamus. So this was the motherland in which we all belonged. And five values represent this nation. The first value is to recall that now we are human beings. So we wanted to reaffirm human dignity. The second value is to go beyond and to focus on spirituality. So we wanted hospitality, solidarity, and benevolence. The third value was transmission. We wanted these values to be given to our children and grandchildren. The purpose being to fight violence and war. The fourth value is hon honorability. So to make sure that we are no longer animals, we need to focus on dignity on, uh, and this is why people need a family name. Finally, in the event of conflict, we should no longer go back to violence, but we should have a mechanism for, for conflict resolution. These are the five values, the five fingers of the right hand. And then there are five key principles which were adopted. These were the, uh, the forbidden things, the things no one should do. So all local authorities needed to gather in order to defend these five key principles and these five key values. And here, it happens at two levels, two levels. Authorities enforce power, but leaders in villages leaders in various uh, age groups, in very various businesses could have their voice heard as well and be legitimate. So this is all for checks and balances. But all this is set in a large framework based on five key principles. First, there is indivisibility. So we don't want the nation to be divided or to collapse. Secondly, we cannot sell our nation. So our nation is not a commodity. Thirdly, we cannot, we cannot sell parts of the nation or resources for personal interest and vested interests. Fourthly, we cannot take the nation or parts of the nation for private interests. So even kings cannot, cannot give the nation to their children. The child needs to be legitimate. He needs to be in a council in order to become king. So everything is based on mandates. And finally, fifthly, we say that we cannot become richer at the expense of the nation. So these are the five key principles of the nation. 
And then on a day-to-day -day basis, how to make sure that all the rights, obligations are enforced. Each and every citizen are trained from birth to 25 years old. There are uh, five steps, five stages of training in order to make sure that everyone can defend the nation's interests. So people need to know that they are part of the nation, that they belong to the nation. And here again, there are five principles. To guarantee the quality of public service, we start with the YECO. It's a principle which says that we need to know, we need to have the necessary information Secondly, it's the Donko principle. So we need to make sure that we know that we master a subject before talking about a subject. Thirdly, it's the Foco principle to state, to say what we have observed in front of legitimate institutions to make sure that uh, what we do is the right approach. And then the Finally, there is the act. As long as we haven't seen, as, as we haven't mastered the topic and observed in the system of governance, we cannot act. Otherwise, it's illeg illegitimate. Finally, the action needs to be benevolent for the family, the community, the nation, or the world in general. So this is what we call the Nyako principle. So these, these are the five principles to see, to know, to state, to accomplish, and to make sure that this is for good interests are the five principles. Then how do we know that all this takes place? Well, all the big families need to gather, and then we can choose the very best which will become the speakers of the movement in men, women, youth, and the elderly. These representatives create then neighborhoods. So they create councils in neighborhoods or in villages. And then the councils go to the capital city in order to advise the king or queen. So it's a bottom up, um, top bottom approach and bottom up approach to make sure that all people, all stakeholders are involved in any issues, men, women, young people and the elderly. And there needs to be a consensus. When one representative disagrees on one issue, then the decision is suspended and negotiations continue until a consensus is passed. First, When there are disagreements among the four representatives, at some point there is an other council and uh, some sort of court needs to, needs to make a ruling about a disagreement. So there are solutions in order to mediate on problems. But when there is a blockade, Then there are leaders, men and women, who have esoteric knowledge and who know the foundations of families, the problems, who have more in-depth knowledge, they also can rule on these problems.
they are called tarikas. There is one minute left, please. So this is what happens if there is a blockade. And if there is a blockade, women, women leaders can oppose their veto. So the process is that in this case, the people who continue to be opposed can be banished. So women can be banished, banned, and the others can be sanctioned. And the purpose is to work for the interest of the entire nation. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you very, very much. That was awesome. And um, it's interesting how some of the questions that we had began to ask, you know, is this, is are all these ancient systems top down? Is mm -hmm. there a place for ordinary people to be involved in these, in these um, systems of governance? And you've given us a great example of how it is possible to organize 